Hey everyone, welcome to the Civic Podcast. Talk about business, AI, and comedy. We're a show that likes to put in some jokes. So if you like jokes, hit like, subscribe, and share, and donate some money on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Civic, because we're cheap bastards. Um, me and Joe are veteran Googlers. Joe is a VP of Eng. I am a uh, mergers acquisitions uh, professional. Some say murders and acquisitions. I don't murder people, but instead we murder companies, you know, because like, like eight out of 10 fail for acquisitions. So it's, it happens. Anyways, Omar is here. Omar is from a wonderful company called Multion AI, and I'm going to read a little uh, an intro um, that I expertly crafted or stole from Omar's LinkedIn profile. Okay, Omar Shai is a co-founder of Multion, um, and he co-founded this along with his uh, uh, colleague Divgarg. Multion is an AI company that develops autonomous agents. Prior to this, he led a product management for core product ranking at Meta and worked on product management at Microsoft Search Assistant and Intelligence hmm. MSAI organization. Additionally, Omar has worked as a product manager at uh, Creolytics. Did I say it pro properly? Creolytics. Okay. Yeah. Creolytics. So my, my best friend, Aditya, his company is called Centalytics. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, Aditya, you know I can't spell <laughs> or pronounce. Like, just like give a brother a chance here. So thank you. Liquid M. <laughs> uh, Two successful startups where he helped incubate and develop AI-based marketing automation platforms. Omar holds an MS in management from Stanford Graduate School of Business. He also has a computer science background, holding a BS and MS degree with a focus on AI from uh, Gottingen University of Germany. He holds several patents and AI applications. Besides his per, uh, professional life, Omar is passionate about classical music and is skilled classical and flamenco guitarist. I was in Madrid, Spain. Uh -huh. I went to my first flamenco uh, event. Oh, heavenly. Awesome. Like, so good, man. And I love Spanish guitar. So this is so good. Uh, if you want to write a theme, if you want to do a theme song for us, Spanish guitar, we'll, we'll, we'll do it. Like just do a, do a riff for us. That'll be your intro music. Um, he is committed to supporting Syrian refugees through education and mm. career development programs and has worked with Ju uh, Jusor, a U.S.-based nonprofit founded by Syrian expats. First of all, what you're, that's the Lord's work right there, what you're doing, or Allah's, Yahweh's work, science's work, or what you're doing for refugees. That's very, very important. So thank you very much for supporting them. Like that, that's, that's huge. We need more founders who are doing things like this. So thank you. Um, that being thank said, we'll, we'll also have a link. We'll have a link to the nonprofit in the, the show notes. Um, that being said, welcome. Uh, thank you having, for, for joining us here. Um, thank you for having awkward. me. Oh, anytime. Um, I'm, I'm very awkward in my introduction, so I apologize. So let's just talk about like, like one, how'd you decide like, hey, let's do this multi-on startup. And then also how'd you meet that, that character Div Garg and just kind of go from there? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's great to, to be on a show that mixes both of my passions, comedy and AI. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Sometimes unintentionally. So, <laughs> yeah um i uh, like I've, I've worked on ai since since college and uh, it was always a dream to build this ai assistant that actually does things for us and kind of pursuing that passion started at microsoft where i worked on the assistant team and so we started building these ai assistant experiences uh, the models were not there yet. We did not have large language models when I was there. Mm -hmm. And so I was, mm -hmm. you know, we were working on what, what you would call traditional machine learning models and trying to get them to work and using deep learning. Uh, we had a few features that were launched, used by millions and millions of people, uh, you know, at Microsoft scale. I even had the opportunity to present some of the work to Bill Gates. Uh, he was always interested in, in these kind of experiences, mm -hmm. even back then. I think that was 2019. Um, Sorry, I got I got to stop real quick. I got to stop real quick. Did you you did you see Bill Gates? Like you were you in the same room or a teleconference or something? Like, no, I sat exactly next to him, the chair next to him. Yeah. <laughs> did it? What, was it like <laughs> when he sat next to you? Was like, oh, Bill <laughs> Gates. Like it was. A... Talk Absolutely. Yeah, I I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I I flew to. I was working at Microsoft in London, and he he was. Um, uh, we, the meeting was in Redmond in the uh, mm -hmm. Microsoft headquarters in, in Redmond, you know, next to Seattle. And um, yeah, the meeting was at the Microsoft boardroom. And mm -hmm. yeah, when he entered the room, I couldn't believe it, man. Like he's, he's definitely been a, a hero of mine since I was like a little kid reading about him in, in PC magazines and computer magazines. <laughs> so it was <laughs> the dream come true to to actually 
sit mm. next to him and and uh, talk to him about our our work. Hell yeah, man! That's an accomplishment too. So good for you. Yeah, um, that's awesome. And, and then to bring you because you're you're like in heaven when you saw him, and then to bring <laughs> you back to to bring you back to earth with Steve Ballmer there, like sweating, saying, "Developers, developers, 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 <laughs> yes." <laughs> I wish no he, he wasn't there. Uh, uh, he wasn't there no but um you know it was definitely a, a, a surreal moment you know for for someone mm -hmm. I I was born and grew up in Syria and um to to be sitting next to Bill Gates in in the Microsoft headquarters was definitely a, a surreal moment. Yeah uh, that's a long and, ways from Redmond in the in the Microsoft boardroom. Uh Yeah. <laughs> But but also to your point, I mean, Gates was really excited about assistance and voice recognition and all that stuff decades ago before the models really became capable. Was he pretty engaged in what you were talking about and, and sort of asking you lots of good questions? Absolutely. He was he was very engaged. He he was very excited about uh, the work. I mean, as you know, he's not in deeply involved with Microsoft anymore, but he still took the time to to do these AI reviews and, and product reviews fo focused on these uh, AI capabilities, assistant capabilities, because he's definitely very excited, has been always excited about this space. Awesome. That's awesome. So you took what you knew there and then eventually like you, the multi-on thing, let's talk about how you and Div built, put the band yeah. together. Because Div, Div's pretty sharp dude. He was getting his PhD at Stanford, right? Exactly. So, so I spent some time at Mike at uh, Facebook or Meta in between. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was working mm -hmm. on uh, ranking and personalization there. And then I decided, mm -hmm. you know what, I really need to build this startup. Um, and the best place to build this startup is Silicon Valley, United States. And, and so I applied to business school at Stanford. Um, uh, one to, to, to get like a period where I transition out of big tech into like building a startup and also to to relocate from london to to silicon valley mm -hmm. and uh there you know i arrived i already had the idea for multi-on and building this ai agent ai assistant startup before llms became a big thing uh after chat gpt so when we were working on this uh, and when i was sharing the idea with people people didn't even know what llms were and mm -hmm. many thought I was talking about legal AI because apparently there is a graduate degree for law that is called LLM. <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, anyway, at Stanford, uh, there were a bunch of uh, student organized dinners and that's where I met Div for the first time, my co-founder. Um, as you said, he was doing his PhD at Stanford. We clicked right away. We, we both worked on similar topics before he, was definitely very technical worked a lot on autonomous agents reinforcement learning and yeah he was definitely a superstar there um, and then later uh, i joined a seminar that he was teaching at stanford on large language models and transformers and and mm -hmm. there we kind of solidified our relationship uh, started working together whiteboarding together and eventually decided you know what, let's just do it. And, and we joined forces kind of officially uh, to, to do this. Dude, hell yeah. Immigrant story here this is what makes America great. We've got two founders coming here in America, making great technology, liberating me from my fucking hell of using like, <laughs> manually clicking stuff. Like you've, you've liberated me. So thank you. Let's, let's people are probably like, what's multi on? Well, fret not. I got a video. So let me get the video going on real quick. And it's going to do a quick overview of this nice, Nice, nice product. Um, if you're listening right now, Silicon Valley Investors Club, don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, let's go. Oh, nope, wrong video. That's in this video, in. I'm going to be showing you Multion, which is one of the most impressive personal AI agents that I've seen to date. Multion allows you to remove a lot of the monotonous work that you do throughout the day when you're using the internet. First, I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration on how this works. I'm going to say, book me a time slot tomorrow at 2 p.m. to do 
yoga. And I'm going to click enter. And pretty quickly, you'll hear a voice speaking back to me. So my speaker's turned up here, which you should hopefully be able to hear. I'm navigating to the Google Calendar event creation page to book a time slot for a yoga session tomorrow at 2 p.m. In the event details for a yoga session tomorrow at 2 p.m., including the title start and end times and a description with a signature as instructed. After the yoga session has been successfully booked for tomorrow at 2 p.m. As you saw there, it went to Google Calendar. It filled out all the details to create that yoga session that I requested. And it did all this just from that natural language prompt that I had. You also saw there that the agent was speaking back to me in real time. If you plan on having it in the background while doing something else, that audio option is a really nice feature. You can see within this chat interface, there's a handful of things here. So you saw me turn on the voice. You can also go configure your agent. And there's also the ability where you can teach the agent. So say if you're using a platform that Multion might not be as familiar with as something like Google Calendar or Uber or DoorDash, something like that. Maybe you're using a proprietary CMS or a proprietary tool and you want to show Multion how to use it. That teach me option is intended to be a way to augment your agent's behavior. Within the interface, you can type a subsequent command here, or you can hold the microphone icon and you can do something like book another yoga session at 9 a.m. on Friday. If I go back to the main interface here, there's a number of different options. So you can go ahead and wish a happy birthday to a friend on Facebook. You can call an Uber from X to Z if you'd like. Now, the thing with the autonomous mode that I found is right off the bat, I didn't necessarily trust it to send an email out of the gate. When I was playing around with this, I didn't want to just start sending emails that might have errors or send them to the wrong people because it does take these actions very quickly. So Multion does really well on a lot of the popular websites that I found. It is in general. It isn't just a gimmick. You actually can go ahead and ask it things across the board. So if I just say, research a email to draft about video sponsorships. And if I just go ahead and enter that in here, what I found interesting with this is observing how an agent like this performs research. When I perform research, I might do it in a very particular way. I might go to Google. I might be biased to reading articles. I might look at videos. I might look at certain resources rather than others. Where what I found with Multion was really interesting is it takes a completely different approach than I would when researching a topic. What I found is that it starts to navigate the web in ways that I didn't even really think about. So if you see here on Google, it clicks a template. It's going to that first option there. And then what's really neat with this is you'll start to see it start to control your browser. So you'll see it scrolls down. It's giving you that information on the right-hand side here where you can, you can look and read through it, or you can go ahead and turn on that agent speaking back to you at any time, which will turn on here. I'm scrolling further down the page to continue looking for additional sponsorship email templates and key points that should be included in a sponsorship request email as per the plan. The other nice thing with this is at any point you can go ahead and pause that. Say this looks like a reasonable place where I can go ahead and minimize the agent here and get the information that I need. You can go ahead and do that, or you can go ahead and write subsequent commands or give audio commands back to it at any time. I think Absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm su super, super uh, excited about what you guys did here. So let's talk about getting to that point. Like, were you all just like, just Thank reading all, reading all the latest research and then you're like, okay, I think we get this stuff in production. Let's take us through that. Yeah. So there are different approaches to, to build an AI agent or an AI assistant. And traditionally, for example, at Microsoft, or if you think of Siri and others, it was mostly focused on building these API integrations. So mm. for every new capability, you had to build a dedicated integration. But that mm -hmm. approach is not scalable. And so for us, we, we were studying the problem and we were looking at, you know, like planes were inspired by birds. So we were like, okay, what can we be inspired by? And we looked at just, just humans, like how do humans do things? And humans do things, most of the time they go up in a browser go to whatever website for that service they want to use and then just use it with clicks and, and scrolling and keyboard. And so that was our inspiration. And so, you know what, like the API approach and integration approach is not scalable. Let's just go and emulate humans, how they use uh, things. And so that's, that was the inspiration for, to go to this route. And then as we started working on this, we found that the web is great for many reasons. First, it's like this, normalized interface to like millions mm -hmm. and millions of services across the world. So you always need to just click or fill some form or scroll. And with these few actions, you can get any, almost anything done. And so mm -hmm. that was a great, uh, for us also as a startup, uh, where we could leverage this existing body of data and knowledge, um, and build a model that can just use these services, uh, with, with just a few interactions to get anything done. Fantastic. Um, Joe, you want to jump in? Looks like you got a question. Yeah, I think what's interesting here is you're, you know, Omar, you're kind of addressing uh, a question we had about when should an agent just go directly to an API and just do the work? And when should it try to use the web browser and the UI? And I think one point you made just now was the UI is a general, high-level, discoverable kind of API for an agent. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Exactly. Uh, 
that that's that's it in a way however what we notice also is that apis sometimes create more limitations like a you there are so many combinations and ways to use a a visual ui like a web interface versus using like a strictly defined api where you cannot be creative so much in using it and so mm -hmm. we found even in cases where it might make sense to use an api for example very straightforward simple task the only benefit you would get is perhaps uh, speed so the api might be a bit faster some of the time but if you can overcome that we found that using a web interface is almost always better because as a human the ai is using the service as you would use it mm -hmm. we're not trying to redefine the way you would use a service or give you results differently from how you would get if you do the task yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you see a middle ground in here like would you advise uh, website owners or application owners to expose anything specific that might help the agent be even more productive with their, with their site, their app? I would say just simplify the UI elements so that our agent right. can work seamlessly with your website. But other than that, I would say just design it for a human. Don't, don't design it for an agent because if you design it for a human, I think the agent that is acting like a human would take the most advantage of it. And I, I, I like also to, to mention another example where if you read the Elon Musk um, biography, the new one, they talk about the, the autopilot in Tesla and how mm -hmm. they transitioned from using radars or LIDARs to just using mm -hmm. uh, vision and cameras because that's how humans drive. And it turned mm -hmm. out that coordinating LIDARs with vision with a bunch of other systems was creating so much complexity that when you removed all that and just used vision as a human would drive, you got a much higher quality driving and better autopilot. Mm. And that's mm. according to the book, that's the approach they are taking now. And so mm -hmm. similarly, I think if you have to then start mixing APIs with web, with other things, you might create unnecessary complexity. Instead, learn from the web, use the web as a human would, uh, because if you give a, if you give a human an assist a human assistant, uh, they are typically very happy if the assistant is is competent. Um, and so the same thing, we're just creating this assistant with AI, uh, but it's acting like a human. Got it. So basically, just build a good website or a good app that's simple that doesn't confuse an ordinary person and you'll be setting yourself up for the agent to do well. Exactly. And this way you get the benefit of also humans using your service if they want to versus <laughs> you making it <laughs> designed just for AI. Yeah. And you're also making the point that maybe by limiting the interaction, to just the ordinary web interface or, or a, a mobile app interface. Uh, some people might think of that as a constraint, but your point is that constraint might actually be the best way to interact with both people and agents. Whereas a more complex or more expansive interaction, like a full API might actually just complicate the situation. Exactly. That would complicate the situation for for an agent, especially an agent that's acting on your behalf as a, as an assistant, perhaps yep. there are some specific use cases, maybe more like enterprise or developer use cases where you need just a fast transfer of data where an API would make sense. But I don't think mm -hmm. the API is the best approach for a general purpose agent that's acting as your assistant. Got it. And I'm just curious now that you're describing this, uh, do you have guidance for an end user trying to work with an agent? Like, are there things they should do to help the agent be more successful? We try to take most of the work ourselves. We, we don't want to yep. have the user learn something new to use our service, to use our agent. Uh, we, we are trying to adapt to users rather than the other way around. So today, 
you might still get better results if you do a better prompt or a better request. But we're trying to overcome that. One of the ways we're trying to overcome that is by leveraging personalization. And also that's part of my background where I spend a, a lot of time working on personalization at Facebook and Meta. And when you personalize the agent, the agent learns about you, remembers your preferences, gets better mm-hmm. at knowing what you mean with fewer words from your side. So mm-hmm. let's say mm-hmm. you start with like, book me a flight on United business class window seat. And next time you, you can just say, book me a flight. And then it will remember your preferences, whether it's the airline or whether it's the window seat or all these other things. And so we're trying to constantly adapt the agent to you. And so your relationship with the agent will improve over time as well. And that's very mm-hmm. similar to if you would hire a human assistant or an executive assistant, your relationship or working relationship will also improve over time because the assistant will start learning about your preferences, will start to get what you mean with fewer words from your side. They will need Mm -hmm. less context. And so similarly, that's how we're trying to design our agent. Got it. And then lastly, uh, before I hog the whole session, where do you see the agents currently having the most difficulty? Like what are the big outstanding problems where it just doesn't work yet and, and you and your team are trying to focus on it? Yeah. So for us in our domain, which is like a general purpose agent, there are a couple of topics. The first one is latency. So we're constantly trying to reduce latency. So this is where we're we're not where we want to be yet, but this will Mm -hmm. be a constant improvement. And I think today it's already fast enough. It's already faster than a human, Mm -hmm. but we want to Mm -hmm. get it to like an instant level where you ask for something and it happens. And so that's, that's one big area that we're investing heavily in. The other area is how long the task could be, like the mm. range of task. So, you know, in our V1, uh, you could ask it to order an Uber for you, for example. So it will go, it figures out how to order your Uber. In, in the next version, you could do much longer tasks, like check my calendar for my next appointment and then order an Uber to that appointment. And then it can go mm-hmm. check your calendar, figures out the address of your next appointment, take that to Uber, it puts the new address in, in the Uber interface, orders your car. So it's just getting longer and longer range tasks. And so this is what we're constantly improving as well. So this context mm-hmm. of the task and how long it can be, this is something mm-hmm. we're also constantly improving. And we're already at a good place to be really useful as an assistant, but we also want it to get even longer and longer and more sophisticated. Right. And you're, you're describing it as longer tasks, but it sounds to me like these longer tasks are also more complex tasks. Exactly. So yeah, it's like a longer range task. It's, it requires multiple steps, multiple applications, perhaps. Um, there is, there might be back and forth with the user sometimes to ask Mm -hmm. like, clarifying or follow-up questions. So yeah, these are the more complex, longer range tasks are Mm. another area that we're constantly improving upon. Awesome. Joe, you never hug. You can keep on going for as long as you want. I'm here for comic relief. (laughs) Occasional. His his answers are so good. They're leading to other interesting questions. Go, go, Joe, go. (laughs) one One thing that I've been noticing in the, in the naming of these, uh, systems is the distinction between an assistant and an agent. And originally I just thought of them as the same, and I'm sure many people do as well. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on how you distinguish the different, I don't know, levels or kinds of these, uh, assistants or agents or whatever you call the whole category. How do you think about the, the taxonomy of these things? Yeah, I do think it's confusing. I do think it doesn't make a lot of sense. I do think that just different taxonomies and, and keywords become popular at some point and everybody just writes on that. Uh, but yep. you know, when we started, we mostly refer to it as an assistant and then suddenly agent became the, the word to describe what we're doing and God knows what's going to be next. I think, uh, 
yeah, this is this is something that we as an industry need to get to get better at with like finding the right name because also I think people throw the word agent now very freely where mm -hmm. it also lost a bit of its meaning. Like so so at what level do you call something an agent versus not an agent versus just a typical application or um, mm -hmm. I think the there was a bit of a negative connotation with the word assistant, uh, especially because mm. the early assistants like Siri, Alexa, and others did not do a great job, did not live up to the expectations of consumers that whenever the people hear the word assistant, they have this kind of negative idea of like, oh, this is something that can set a timer and recall the weather, but that's it. And so right. we noticed that agent solved a bit of that problem but now we see that the word is thrown on everything and it's also lost a bit of its meaning so we yeah. we try to always communicate uh what we do clearly ideally without having to use either assistant or agent we just try to an ai that complete tasks for you from start to finish i think that's kind of the last Ah. tagline we came up with this it's like whether you call it an agent or an assistant or whatever there is an ai there that's completing a task from start to finish fully it's sure. doing it on the web today and maybe in the future it will do it on other places beyond the web uh, but yeah definitely the taxonomy can be a bit confusing well that was an interesting teaser other places beyond the web hopefully we'll get back to that one uh and try to squeeze more out of you but before we move on from this, throwing out the taxonomy, uh, it seems like there are tasks that are kind of request response. I'm the user. I say, go find me this flight, put it on my calendar. Maybe it's a complex task, but even so it's a request. Some stuff magic happens. We don't know if it's an agent or an assistant or whatever the heck you want to call it. We'll leave that to the marketing people. Uh, but that system does a bunch of work on my behalf and comes back with some results. And then I think of a follow on step where maybe the system wakes up at arbitrary times, maybe when more results are available and then comes back to me with more updates like, Hey, those flights you were asking about, they just got cheaper or some other crazy thing. You can, you probably have better scenarios than me, but this kind of ongoing, I'm working for you in the background and I might come back multiple times before this larger job is finished. How do you think about those sorts of open-ended tasks? Yeah, it's definitely an area that we will expand into at some point. So to give you another example, I know many people in New York City like to get a reservation at this restaurant, Carbone, which is really hard to get reservation. At. And they apparently open their reservations at midnight on certain days. And so you mm -hmm. want the agent to keep an eye once it's open, make a reservation. And so mm -hmm. that's one mm -hmm. example where the task is not real time. You're okay with it being done uh, at a, on, on its own pace whenever it's possible, and then mm -hmm. just come back to you with the results. And so, yeah, we hear these requests sometimes. I would say they are not as frequent or as critical as mm. the higher frequency tasks, higher complexity tasks that Maybe you would do them day to day or uh, week to week, but it's definitely an area that we can get into. Um, and technically it's not complicated for us given where we are today. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just a matter of like deciding whether it's the right time to go there. Interesting. You also mentioned the previous generation of assistants, uh, Siri and, and Alexa and so on. And in my imagination, those are kind of, old school, more like the way I would write a program or match a template kind of systems. You know, I have certain templates for setting a timer and you can ask me to set a timer six different ways. And if I don't recognize one of those templates, when you make your request, I say something stupid, like, sorry, I can't help you. Or can you rephrase your question? Uh, versus where we are with large language models. Did you have the same kind of realization? Cause you were in the middle of working on these things. Yeah, absolutely. Once we saw the developments with large language models, it was clear that this will unlock 
the potential of these assistants and it will make many things that weren't possible before finally possible. And so that was one of the motivations why I decided that, oh, the time was now to build mm. this, this company. Um, these, yeah, th these technological shifts are the, the ones that open the window for new companies to be built and, you know, things that were not possible before, but are possible now. Um, mm -hmm. are, these are the waves that enable like new disruptive startups to be built. Was that the only enabling thing that you saw or were there other things like vision models or something else happening? I was always focused on language models. We, we do rely on some vision today, but language models were always the area I focused on. So I wasn't mm -hmm. really, I haven't spent a lot of time on vision uh, in my past experiences. I've mostly focused on language models and that was the area I was uh, tracking. And so this was mm -hmm. like, yeah, the major, um, at least technical insight that, that triggered this. Um, vision definitely is helpful, uh, but at least with our approach, especially that it's uh, with a focus on the web today, language mm -hmm. is the more impactful area. I see. So your approach now is looking at the web content, maybe reformatting or simplifying it. There's a whole bunch of techniques there and using that as the kind of observation. And then the language model is following some step-by-step uh, -step task description or plan that it's created against those observations, employing certain actions. This is a pretty well-established framework, I think. So now we do use vision as well at this point. Uh -huh. Yep. Uh, bec because there is meaningful data or meaningful insights to get from also understanding the visual aspects of, of a page or a service. And then mm -hmm. we built our own uh, internal models, which we refer to them as action models, mm -hmm. which is takes a task and it transforms it or translates that into the actions, predicts the, the next action that it needs to take. So in a way, similar to how a language model is trained to predict the next word or the next character, the action model is trained to predict the next action. And so mm -hmm. you get the task, that's one context. You get the web page. The web page is, as you said, is transformed. We have our own special embedding model that we also built in house. You also get some additional context about the user through personalization. Mm -hmm. And then based on all these, the model predicts the next action it needs to take. It takes that action. And again, it tries to predict the following action and the following action until it completes the task. Got it. And, and sort of flipping the problem over, you saw that language models enabled this approach or at least uh, enabled you to do something better than the old systems like Siri or Alexa. Is there anything now that you feel is holding back these sort of systems like places where the language model is not good enough or places where some other technology has to happen? So we do think that... Uh... You know, the problem with hallucination um, mm -hmm. is sometimes still an issue, although we're, mm -hmm. we're mm -hmm. getting better at handling that. The speed is another issue. So language models are still our bottleneck when it comes to speed. Mm -hmm. So they are the slowest part of our system. Mm -hmm. And so we're also working on um, solutions uh, to solve that problem, including on-device models. And... I think these are the two key issues. I mean, obviously they are still expensive, whether to use or to train. And so yep. the cost aspect would be also beneficial, but it's not the most critical at this point. Mm. I mean, cost and speed are sort of joined together, right? Yeah. Like you could, you could pay a lot more money and get it a little, little faster if you wanted to. Uh, actually not really, uh, at this point, at least like at this point, uh, even if you pay more money, there is a, there is a kind of a, a threshold for how ah. fast you can get it as of today. Yeah. Yeah. 
So we have this one video called Dead Tech Companies Walking, who will be crushed by ChatGPT. Uh, plus, we also have videos of challenges of AI agents. And for the people of kink, we have the adult entertainment industry meets AI. No, you're not going to see Joe naked in that video. Well, actually, you could possibly see me or Joe naked in that video. That can only happen if you go to patreon.com forward slash SVIC and give us $5. Then you'll see if maybe one of us is naked. Also, you get access to our reading list. Like, I crack the whip on Joe on a regular basis. I'm like, update this shit, goddammit. He's like, okay, I'm just busy buying more Hawaiian islands, but he gets his best research papers. I'm talking straight bangers that he puts in here. And then we summarize it. So you get to actually not have to read the whole paper. You get GPT four summary and then decide if you want to read it or not. But we have like hundreds of papers here, binders full of papers here. No, we're not talking like Mitt Romney shit. We don't talk that way about women. Stop being weird like that. But anyways, um, patreon.com forward slash S V I C that's patreon.com forward slash S V I C. And for five bucks a month, you get access to all of our, fantastic episodes we, we put a new one out every week like straight fire so patreon.com forward slash svic thank you so interesting uh a couple questions on the m a money grubbing capitalist and self-centered so first i'll start with <laughs> i noticed i noticed you're going to do um you're going to go to ios so why did you betray us brown people and not go with android first that's my first loaded question. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the phone of the people, bro. No, I'm just, I understand. iOS is where it's at, but do, do you, I know you're going to be launching what this quarter with your iOS app. Is Android going to follow after that or what, what's the plan? It's probably going to be next quarter. Um, I don't yeah. like to share timelines because so we, we're definitely in an advanced stage. We, we, we run these private beta and pilots. And we constantly evolve the product until the level where we think it's ready to be publicly available. And so the, the reason we chose iOS is simply because it's the more, more popular platform in the U.S. And since we're mostly based in the U.S. At, the, at this time, it's a good place to start. But clearly, you know, we want to put this in the hands of every person on the planet. And so we're, we're following with, with Android soon. And actually... Internally, we already made it work on Android. Um, so this is kind of uh, an ex exclusive here, but uh, we actually tested it on Android and, and we have it working on Android just as like the model itself. Uh, but uh, to, to build a, a whole consumer app is, is something we're going to do later. Gotcha. Mm. So I have an opportunity for you to redeem yourself from being a sellout. Um, I'm, I have, I have my credit card right now. I'm actually going to, I'm going to sign up for the $20 a month thing. Cause it's great. And you could redeem yourself. If you give me early access to Android, that would make <laughs> all the rest of us 4 billion people who have Android would be okay. So long as we're agreed on okay. that now, let's oh talk about, gosh. let's talk about, let's talk about, let's get a deal. I, of course, M and a, let's talk about going from the idea that you and your co-founder had mm. to getting to an alpha to then getting feedback and then magically now Jordan has beta. Like what was that? Was that like a six month process? Like just talk about all that for us. I'm super interested about that. So the process from idea to where we are now, is that the yep. question? Yep. Yep. Yeah. You know, the, the, the best way to learn about something is to do it. <laughs> and so we naively thought that we can do it, uh, putting our experiences together, uh, you know, as you mentioned, my co-founder was doing his PhD in, in AI at Stanford. I've worked on AI assistants before. I, I also have two computer science degrees. I studied in Germany. And, and so we first decided on this web-based approach, and then everything started as a side project as grad students. And, and we got to the point where we made it actually work, uh, you know, some... The, the earlier tests were like on Twitter, on DoorDash, kind of get these tasks done. And once we saw that, oh, we can actually make it work, that was like the, once we figured out the approach to make it work on like these simpler tasks, we figured out, okay, so now it's time to scale. And so then the, the problem was then from like figuring out the approach, once we figured out the approach, it turned into a problem of scaling and optimizing that approach until mm -hmm. the point where it is today. So obviously it was slower, it was less capable, like fewer tasks. It was capable of also like shorter range tasks. We discussed about the complexity of the task as well. And then over time, you know, we figured out how to optimize it, how to make it faster, how to 
train it so that it can do longer and longer and longer and more complex tasks. And so this mm-hmm. kind of in a nutshell, obviously it wasn't as linear as it sounds. We've, we've hit some roadblocks. We had to overcome those and um, until we, we are where we are today. And obviously we're still hit many roadblocks along the way. So it's always kind of the case, but you have to just keep mm-hmm. believing. So it sounds like <laughs> su- surprises. Well, um, maybe you can talk about some of the surprises that you saw and then also what surprised you when it got into your user's hands where you're like, mm. oh, wow, I never thought about people using it that way. That's cool. I would say the we were really surprised by the reaction uh, that people have when they see it for the first time. It was a strong reaction. Like we, we haven't seen any product getting this reaction before, especially like a software product. Um, and so we were really excited to see the reaction on people's faces when they tried it or when they saw it for the first time. I think people were so impressed, very excited that they finally see an assistant that can actually do things for them. That can actually complete tasks from start to finish. It's not only about chatting with you or generating an image, although all these things you know are great and very useful, but actually completing a task that you would otherwise do yourself, seeing the AI use the browser, as you, if you are using it yourself, the reaction was much stronger than, than we have anticipated. And, and so in a way it went viral. We have tens of thousands of people signed up. And so that was a surprise. What was your uh, other part of the question? Oh, no, the surprise and then... Um... What do they do with it? What do they do what did, with it? What, like, you... what are the use cases? Like you're like, I never thought oh, yeah. of that use case before. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the crazy ones. The crazy ones. One of the crazy ones, I don't know if it's crazy, but we just never thought about it was somebody was using it to log their meals on my fitness pal. And they were like, oh my God, it's such a time saver. I mm. log my food three times a day plus snacks. Logging food requires you, you know, specific menus mm-hmm. and add all these mm-hmm. items. Instead, you just put the text of what you ate and then multi on automatically figures out how to do the logging for you. So that was uh, an interesting use case that uh, surprised us. Um, I would say the other example is something that's a bit more like shopping, for example, is straightforward, but how far you can take shopping was interesting where instead of, uh, ordering some meal from DoorDash, you can say, oh, I feel like eating spaghetti tonight and I want you to order the ingredients for a spaghetti uh, recipe. And so instead of you having to think about all this, so you rely on multi-on, multi-on kind of figures out a, a spaghetti recipe, figures out the ingredients, goes mm-hmm. to whatever Walmart or something, orders all these ingredients for you. So like a, a, a more complex multi-step task you, you, mm. You've done it with just a, sim- a simple sentence of like, hey, I feel like spaghetti, order the spaghetti and greens for me. And so taking like a, a task mm-hmm. uh, that is relatively simple, like ordering food and, and turning it into a much more complex and, and longer task because Multi-On now can do that for you. That's fantastic. Um, also, I was thinking... Can it do like shopping research for you? Like saying, hey, um, I'm looking for certain types of tables, uh, two by two coffee table for outdoors so my dad can put coffee on it and not yell at me. Can you go <laughs> through multiple sites and find me different types of coffee tables and then put it in a spreadsheet for me? Uh, so it doesn't work well with spreadsheets yet. Uh, that's some, or that's let's an just area. say any doc, any doc or just yeah. put it, just put it yeah. It does, yeah. So it, it cool. works if you have like some note-taking uh, site it does that really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, another actually interesting uh, use case that we found uh, exciting was someone who was selling on Facebook Marketplace and had Multion go and reply to all the sellers, uh, ah. the buyers or potential buyers, and say, "Hey, if they if they offer more than one hundred and seventy dollars, then give them my address and phone number and tell them to call me. If not, mm-hmm. just respectfully decline." And so it was very interesting yes. because this. You can automate, you know, if you had like 20, 30 messages, you can have Multion go through all of them and reply with the right answer to each of them. 
Oh, oh this okay. is the dangerous one, Omar. You're like one step from the guy who responded to all of his uh, Tinder messages until he negotiated and eventually found his wife, right? I'm sure you saw that guy's case. I No, I haven't actually. Wait, wait, I'm going to look it up. Yeah, oh, I just said no, – sorry. This case basically was he was like, screw this left swipe, left swipe, right. I'm going to go chat GPT, connect to the Tinder or whatnot, swipe for me, and then start chats with all these women. And then chat GPT would look at my my interests and what I like and then grill them on my questions. And then eventually chat GPT comes back and says, I think these these are the ones are the match. And he married yeah. one of them and now he's like happy as a clam. He basically, <laughs> built a, he basically built a sales funnel and used chat GPT and some framework to sort of evaluate the candidates, if you will, and narrow it down wow. until he until he decided who to meet in person. And it okay. sounds like he, if he was doing it now, he would use something like Multion and treat it as a, a task, uh, like a large shopping task, the way you described. Maybe right. we, I don't think we tried it on dating apps, but th that sounds feasible. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, okay, so that's one of my saws right now is that like most dating apps are crap, and eventually something like this, like what you have, is going to come in and just come awake every 20, 40, 48 hours, do your free swipes, talk to people, and then start queuing up a list of like, here's who might be a potential match for you, like kind of like a matchmaking service with digitally. Um, also, you got me thinking too of um, there's so many different enterprise use cases for what you're doing, and I hope that you, you all. Mm -hmm. Don't get stuck in the, okay, we're going to go and try to serve these enterprise companies with their ridiculous requirements and laws. Like, I like how you're saying very consumer focused. You can sidestep all that crap. But one of my use cases was on the real estate side of like, you always get people who apply for a property to live in and they don't read what you have listed there it specifically says like no pets, no dogs or something. And then having multi on come in and just basically read what they said, go back to what your requirements are and like confirm, like, no, it says there's no, there's no cats or dogs here. Sorry. You can't do it unless it's a service animal. Um, sorry. I digress. Uh, the Ra rabbit R one launch, uh, it hasn't come out yet, but any thoughts on the R one, like what they were doing and just any general feedback. So the first, thing that surprised us about that was was that they had a slide that had multi on on it in their keynote so around like in the first like five minutes or so he had a slide in the keynote and we were just watching the keynote i was like oh that looks familiar <laughs> and so, um <laughs> so, so look, they, we stole, saw that. they took your they took your they took your slide or had your name on it or just had your no, they, they were talking it, so. about other plays in the market basically oh, they had okay, like a competitive mm. slide and they and they had us our interface and logo and everything on that slide uh, behind behind uh, the presenter and uh, you know we we did not we did not um, take the hardware route we just think that we'd like we'd rather start from or we'd rather meet people where they are already are whether it's on your phone or on your laptop in your browser on your maybe smart speaker in the future. But basically we, mm -hmm. we like to meet people where they are and our core competency today is software and AI. So we, we have a different approach. We, we do have, think it's unlikely that people will adopt a new device at this moment, unless mm -hmm. the device, the, unless the new device can really, you know, fulfill incredible use cases or very useful use cases. But it's unlikely that I think a new device will replace the phone anytime soon. Now, this mm -hmm. might be possible in, in a few years. Um, uh, I think, you know, we, the conditions are there for that to happen, given the, the, the new capability that AI has unlocked. Mm -hmm. But as of today, we think it's a bit still too early. So maybe it's a good start, and I'm excited to see how it will play out. Um, you know, we maybe this sounds like a cliche, but we we kind of focus on achieving our vision. We focus on building w what we think our users want and need, and we're gonna see how things evolve in the market as a whole. And you know, if a new device is required. We might consider it as well, but for now we're fully focused mm. on on our approach. 
that's a good point because you take on the hardware plus the action models. It's like that's hard. Either one is crazy as it is compared to saying I'm just gonna not crazy difficult. So let's focus on the software layer that we know and let someone else handle all the hardware stuff. Now I wanted to jump in here regarding your pricing. Um, pricing is like an alchemy almost. Like so, how did you how did you think of your pricing? And after going to pricing, I want to talk about funding because i don't think i don't know if you guys are funded or not so let's start with pricing walk us through that and we'll go from there yeah absolutely so we we took a a few factors one is the cost how much would it cost if you use it ultimately every day all day and second we looked at willingness to pay and what how the market looks like and it seems that this 19 20 30 dollars a month is where the market is at right now whether it's chat gpt the microsoft copilot and others mm -hmm. and we think we are a comparable product and and so given the our cost and and given the market that's the the sweet spot that we landed on of course we always try to reduce the 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 prices because we want as many people as possible to be using this and so this might change in the future, but as of today, this was like the sweet spot between cost and like willingness to pay. Mm. Nice. Yeah, I I went through my 100 already and I'm like, okay, here's my credit card. I was, I was literally paying right now. So I'm like, yeah. So yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> Thank um, you. Appreciate it. No, you're welcome. No, I, I'm excited about it. I also, my petty request getting in the Android version, but also, all right, I'm first of all, uh, English is my first language and I'm terrible at it. So let me get to <laughs> the, my questions more of what are you thinking about like fe like features going forward that you're thinking like, ah, oh, there's a features. This is worth, yes. And if you don't want to share, it's all good. Okay. 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 No, I, I mean, I can share. Uh, so to, to close your last question, we're, we've been very excited to have General Catalyst as our lead investor in our first round, uh, which also included Amazon, uh, the Alexa Fund, uh, Samsung, and Maven Ventures, uh, along with angel investors from OpenAI, early investors in DeepMind, some other great founders that we have tremendous respect for. So we've been very lucky with the group of investors that, that invested in our first round last summer. Mm -hmm. So on, our, on, the, on the future, roadmap the you know going to mobile is definitely top of the list we we want to be with you all the time uh, we want to make it easier for you to delegate tasks also hands-free whether you're driving or you're just on the go so going to mobile is is one of the top things we're working on right now our model is also our product, right? So we're constantly improving the model, its reliability, the complexity of the tasks that can complete. All of these things will constantly be improving. So latency, all that stuff. Um, this is a, something that will always you know, be a, a topic that we focus on. And lastly, personalization. So we already have personalization and we want to constantly invest in personalization so that the, the experience and the agent really knows you. And the more you use it, the better the experience will get because it will learn about your preferences. It will understand your requests with fewer words. Uh, eventually it will become proactive, as you mentioned. So it anticipates mm -hmm. your needs. You don't even have to ask it to do things. It will anticipate also some things that does it for you. I love that because that's how you get sticky and that's how you differentiate yourself. I've seen a lot of people who are just like, we're going to just call them GPT-4 and put a nice website on top. And it's like, but then how do you build anything defensible? Um, we have about five more minutes left, unfortunately. Joe, how about you take two and a half minutes with your section? And then I want to spend two and a half minutes on JSOR so we can go over it and hopefully raise some funds for them. I'll do a quick one. Omar, you mentioned a few times the idea of a smart speaker or uh, Alexa, Google Home, these different products. Uh, and it's interesting that they that their fund was one of your investors. It strikes me that your product essentially makes those products obsolete. Uh, or maybe another way to say it is that software such as from Multion could replace the software that was backing up those smart speakers and I think make them much more useful. 
do you think that category is dead or does it get upgraded and the software side or what happens to all these smart speakers that everyone bought? You know, I, I love my smart speakers. I have Alexa, I have a HomePod from Apple because it has good quality for music. And I do think our model will complement them. It will not replace them. I think it will make them better, more capable, so that it can do much more with them. I think, let's say if you're on Alexa, Alexa will have a better access to Amazon Music and maybe the Amazon retail store. With our model, it will be able to do much more on the web, all these different services that cannot access today, it will be able to access. You know, the HomePod will still be better at accessing Apple Music, but if they, I, you know, if Apple decides <laughs> to integrate with us, they will have then, they will unlock a whole new world of capabilities um, that were impossible before. So I do think these types of speakers will stay, they will get better with models like ours. Um, and so hopefully they will, you know, take the step and, and talk to us. Awesome. Well, let's go to, uh, uh, J is it Jace Jusur? I'm probably saying it incorrect. Um, but let's talk a little about it. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are about it. Like, and kind of go from there. So this is a, an organization that was started by a group of Syrian expats uh, in 2011, around the same time when the Syrian crisis uh, was, was happening. And I was one of their first students that received a scholarship from this organization. Uh, nice. But I was fortunate, I was fortunate enough to have had another scholarship at the same time. <laughs> Uh, just uh, a few months earlier so that I did not uh, end up taking this. But I got to meet the founders and I really wanted to help because you know I was one of the lucky ones who, who got to leave the country and had access to great education uh, abroad. And I wanted you know, to, to pay it forward. And so I was heavily involved uh, with Jusur. Um, Jusur, most of the people who uh, started Jusur were based in the U.S. And so since I was based in Germany, and Germany had received the highest number of Syrian refugees in Europe, I was kind of the ambassador for Jusur in Germany. We, we organized career development workshops, education workshops, where we help people understand how to apply to schools and scholarships. And then I've also organized fundraising dinners and events so that can have the funds necessary to provide scholarships for students to study um, abroad, uh, whether it's in, in Europe, the US, Canada. And um, the, the former chairman uh, or chairwoman of, of Jusur, uh, Rania Sukar, is, is a Syrian American who's the CEO of MailChimp today. And wow. so she's, uh, she she was born in the U.S., grew up in the U.S., uh, but had a strong Syrian connection. And I was fortunate enough to to get to know her uh, in 2011. And, and we've been uh, friends since, and I've been helping uh, Jasur and Syrian refugees uh, since. Um, and she was one of the ones who wrote my recommendation letters to Stanford nah. Business School when I was applying. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Well, I mean, it sounds like y'all are doing fantastic work. I mean, you've helped 14,000 kids. You're supporting 400 scholars, trained 2,300 entrepreneurs. So if y'all would like to support them, go to jasour.ngo. It's J-U-S-O-O-R.ngo. It's J-U-S-O-O-R.ngo. Um, Omar, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate what you're doing here for tech what you're also doing for um, Syrian refugees and everything. Uh, you're a great dude. Um, and uh, we look forward to hopefully get you back on here. And um, we'll talk to you later. For all you are watching, don't forget to like and subscribe and share. Peace. See ya.